Hey guys, welcome back to the FFP. My name is Christian, joined here by Rob as always. And today we're going to be getting into our week 10 waiver wire considerations. Last week, it felt like the waiver wire was completely dead as can be, which is zero talent. This week, I feel like there's a bit of a resurgence, a little bit more options out there. So that is always nice. For those of you who haven't been around our channel, we'll let you know kind of the basic rundown. There will be timestamps down in the description below so you can see who we're going to talk about and when we're going to talk about them. That's always nice, saves a lot of time. The comment section down below, we're huge on that. For starters, liking the video, subscribing, and commenting, those are some of the best ways to help support us if you like what we do. The other thing being, hopefully we'll get around to answering some comments, hopefully we'll get around to answering your comments, particularly questions or concerns. I know last week I made a prediction that was very unpopular with about four or five people who all made comments about my prediction, but because you guys left comments, I was able to go down, respond to you, and actually give you a further breakdown, right? Here's why, here's some things I didn't have time to say in the video, boom, boom, boom. I think that it was really nice to be able to do that. That's a big reason that we have that comment section before. So you guys can give us some pushback, which I really appreciate, and then I can explain my uh, justifications for it more. But that doesn't matter. Let's continue on the video. Um, I think there's some really great options to consider. And what we're going to do is talk about maybe some of the options we like most at the beginning. And then after that, we will go by position. But let's not waste any more time, Rob. Let's get right into it. And I believe you got the first couple guys we're going to talk about. Yeah, I'm going to get into the first slide. I'm actually glad you brought it up. Uh, one of the things that we talk about is before we go to any conclusions about what, talk about waiver wire starts at video, things like that information, uh, we go really deep in a lot of stuff. We really break it down, but we don't give you all those pieces of information the reason why we don't uh we've tried it a few times and our videos get incredibly long and so we're giving you just kind of condensed um but once again if you want especially for patreon person we'll, we'll give you a more in-depth breakout so you know we do have more information to support what we have we just want to put in the video we don't want it to be three hours long and so it's not three hours long let's get into that first slide so the first two guys i want to talk about are Kenyon drake 27 percent available and chase Edmond 64 percent available but i want to first start talking about Kenyon drake See a guy that you should pick up, go after in the waiver wire, should he be your number one choice there? Now, if you followed us here at the FFP for a couple of years, you know this. We actually like Kenyon Drake. We've talked about him quite often. This is a guy that we have broke down in the past, and he's really had some good metrics. And it looked like in limited play in the past where he's had some success, he looks like he's a guy that he could have more opportunities, more touches. He could be a legitimate running back there. But for whatever reason, coaches have always seemed hesitant to really stick to him and give him those opportunities. And then this year, he, he was really buried on a bad team who uh, just can't say committed to the run because they're playing from behind. The offensive line has opened up holes. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why he hasn't been very successful um, past years or even this year. But once again, I think some of the metrics are there. I think he's shown at times the ability to be successful. He gets traded the Cardinals this week. So what's our assessment of this guy? What's his value? Should he grab him going forward? Uh, is he going to repeat what he did last week? Uh, total disclosure. If you watch our Start Sit video, you know that last week I actually said you should sit him going into Thursday night's game. Uh, now, based on that information, I would still say that was the right choice to make. And I'll tell you why. Every once in a while, you, you make the right choice based on the information you're given. And every once in a while, a player will do that. He'll have a breakout game. But I think you still got to go back, put your feelings aside. Don't play hunches. You got to play the numbers. You got to play the breakdown. And here's what we knew going into the game. He'd only been there three days. Just got there. Still unpacking, right? Still packing his bags. I don't know where he's probably staying in a hotel, another player's um, extra bedroom. So he's still learning the playbook and acquainted with the offense. And he was facing the second best defense in the NFL, averaging just over 10 points per game. They allowed the third fewest points to running backs. So based on that, we thought you should sit him. But in spite of all that, all that was working against him. He was excellent against San Francisco on Halloween. This guy had a huge game. He goes up 15 carries, 110 rushing yards, at a very healthy 7.33 yards per carry. He adds that four catches, 52 yards, a touchdown, and a two-point conversion. Um, he's a guy that if you watch him, he can be explosive. He's got good hands. He's great in space. He's elusive there. I see, somebody should grab what is his value, okay? Well, his value is in direct proportion to Chase Edmonds and David Johnson's injuries and their availability, bottom line. Depend upon those guys' availability. If they're healthy, that's going to determine his value there. And for me, um, I think that this Cardinals running back situation in terms of fantasy football is turning into, a, like I would say, a really bad situation for all those running backs, especially for David Johnson owners, which you are one, right? I am one of them, and it's so, unfortunate because a lot of his value came from volume. Yeah. Last year was a year where his efficiency was terrible, but he got the ball so much it didn't matter. That's not the case anymore, and that is making me very uncomfortable. You shouldn't. I think you should be a little concerned there. Uh, Chase Edmonds, when he played, was great. 5.1 <laughs> yards per carry, five touchdowns. Drake is a very good quality back, but make no mistake, I will say this, David Johnson, when healthy, is still going to be the lead back on that team. He's got great hands. In fact, quite a lot of coaches and players that have played with David Johnson, they actually said that his hands rival great um, running backs with hands before, like Marshall Falk and others. Hey, this guy's phenomenal in the passing game, um, so he's going to be the best guy in terms of that on that team. 
Um, and he's by far the biggest of the three backs as far as size goes, making him more likely to absorb more carries and just kind of uh, get greater uses there. Now, I think Drake can be used as long as Johnson's out. If he sits, and if I was the coach, it's not inconceivable to think that, you know, Coach Kingsbury could rest Johnson one more week, give Drake another opportunity to be a good fantasy start, rest him, get his guy back to 100% healthy. But according to Coach Kingsbury, he said David Johnson is expected to suit up in week 10 against the Buccaneers. So they're looking at this point that he's going to play already. Now we're going to monitor this situation that goes on. Now I think Drake um, is a handcuff. And if you're a, if you're a Johnson owner, I think you've got to handcuff Drake at this point. You've got to get him on your team. He's got to be handcuffed to David Johnson. Now, like we said, Chase um, is also going to see carries. Chase Evans has played well, so when he's healthy again, um, he's going to get carries. And that's going to lower Kenyon Drake's value or his floor a little bit on this one. So for me, when I take a look at it, uh, all those guys, I got uh, when they're all healthy, David Johnson, number one guy, Kenyon Drake will be number two. And Chase, for me, is third in that pecking order. I would not grab him right now. The only way I'd grab Chase Evans is if either Drake or Johnson misses some times there. Now, against the 49ers, Kenyon Drake was amazing. He played great, but you need to damper some of your expectations. If you think he's going to be a viable, trustworthy um, option moving forward week to week, um, that's just not going to be the case. He really needs an injury there, or maybe David Johnson's held out another week um, for him to have value. So that's kind of my breakdown there. Once again, had a great week. I think he's got some skills. I think in the right situation, he'll be successful. But right now, that's looking like the dreaded running back by committee with David Johnson leading those three backs and getting a majority of the touches. Right now, I'd say David Johnson, when fully healthy, is a low-end running back to in PPR leagues. All right, now I think we absolutely have to talk about Zach Pascal and Paris Campbell. I think these are two very young and very talented wide receivers. I'm actually very excited about both of them. Heading into this week, it's a good matchup in Week 10 versus the Miami Dolphins. We have the 10th most fancy points to wide receivers. So there's a lot to like, uh, but it's not just the matchup. Um, and I think many of you know this, but in case you don't, currently T.Y. Hilton sounds like he's going to be out three to four weeks. So T.Y. Hilton will be out for week 10 for sure, probably 11, 12. We'll see into the future. Um, but of course, with the number one wide receiver out in a good matchup, they bump up to the number wide receiver one and two. I think it's a great situation, but that's not the only reason. The numbers have, have been there. Um, there's been some things to be impressed with. After a first couple of bad weeks from Zach Pascal's opening the season the first two weeks, um, he got better after he had 50. 53 yards and a touchdown. And he followed that week with four catches, 72 yards, really started to kind of get on our radar as a guy that we were noticing. Um, and then he disappeared case versus the Kansas City Chiefs and thought, okay, maybe that was just an anomaly. But then the next game, he bounces back, six catches, 106 yards, and two touchdowns. There's a bit of volatility there and inconsistency that definitely has to make you nervous. But I definitely like this guy. I mean, I'd rather have a guy who's having inconsistency, but in his inconsistency is having good games, as opposed to a guy who's very consistently sucking every week. I mean, that's simple breakdown, but of course he gets a huge boost from T.Y. Hilton being out. Um, of those two guys, I do like Zach Pascal over Paris Campbell. Now, I do like Paris Campbell. Um, he's a rookie. He was drafted pretty early. They were excited about him. I was excited about him coming in this year to see what he could do, and I thought that he was a fairly solid sleeper. Um, and today he kind of showed that. Five targets, five catches, 53 yards, plus three carries for 27 yards. Um, so it was a good day. Now, I'm not hopping on him to be super excited. For example, when 27 of his yards came on three carries, that seemed very unusual to me. That's not a number you're going to see consistently this year or next year from him because he's not a wide receiver known for being that sort of Cordell Patterson type that's super versatile is going to be used all over the place. Um, I like both of these guys. I do like Zach Pascal more. However, there is kind of got to hit the brakes a little bit while we deal with this Jacoby Brissett thing, right? With his injury, he left this week's game and did not return. Sounds like it's something that's not too serious, but he could miss a week. That, that's at least what we know right now. I'm not going to, um, I guess, put myself out there and risk sounding like an idiot by saying anything is for sure or any facts. So you're going to have to check in with our start sit video on Tuesday night and our injury update video on Friday. So we have more time and just more information for you guys on that. But their value is definitely hurt if Jacoby Brissett is out. So that's a breakdown. I really like Paris Campbell as a week to week playable matchup if Brissett is in and especially if Hilton is out. Yeah, I like uh, Zach Pascal. I've actually used him two the last three weeks, been able to capitalize on his good games. And one of the reasons why I trust him this week and started him one, Hilton was out, so that made it a lot easier, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, he had a huge game, six catches over 100 yards, two touchdowns, and then the week after, he kind of disappeared statistically, 
they actually appeared on his team snaps over 90% of the offensive snaps. He was on the field, which is telling me he's out there. He's lined up as the number two guy. And that's what I want to know how often he's on the field there. And I think he's solidifying his uh, really hold in that number two position. So I actually like Pascal. And I think I'm going to like him even when Hilton comes back. Yeah, and I think the argument that I think a lot of people made when they examined the situation was Paris Campbell's younger. He's the rookie. Zach Pascal is a year two wide receiver. He's a sophomore. He is young enough that I don't see an age difference being a thing for them. They, I would almost consider both them rookies at this point. And I actually kind of – I do – like Zach Pascal more. I'm excited to see who he can do going into next year. Let's talk about Adrian Peterson, 45% available, and Darius Guy, 68% available. A lot of people are asking about Darius Guy. the guy you should grab, should you know stash him, especially if you're in a dynasty league. Well, let's break that down. Let's talk about Adrian Peterson at first. First of all, we need to say this. Next week, they're on a bye. But with the running back position so thin, it's so hard to find good backs out there right now. Injuries are popping up. you got running back by committee, bye weeks, you name it. He's a guy that I think if you're desperate for a back, you should stash him now. Don't wait till he comes off his bye week because somebody else will probably grab him before you do. Now, since interim coach took over, they really committed to the run, and it's really meant the rebirth for Adrian Peterson's fancy value. Um, he's a guy that looks like he's really turned back time. He looks strong. He's making sharp cuts, explosive. He's doing that behind the offensive line that a lot of our running backs for the Redskins have struggled to run behind this year, but Adrian Peterson's doing it, and he looks really good doing that. Then the four-game strength that the interim coach took over, Coach Callahan, uh, Adrian has twice been over 100 yards rushing in a game. During that same stretch, he's had a total of 383 rushing yards, and this is great. This is what I love. It's not just bombs. It's not like he's just getting 35 carries a game, but he's been bad. Those four games, his yards per carry have been 5.11, which is really, really good. He's averaging 18.75 carries per game. He's the lead back, and he's mixing a couple catches here and there, so they are keeping him out on some passing downs, which is good. He's become a solid weekly running back to option standard leagues. Now let's get to Darius Geis, who's 68% available. Um, team anticipates he's going to return in action for week 17 against the Jets. So Darius is going to come back, sounds like, in week 17 there after the bye. Now, I would imagine that the Redskins brass, uh, the team there, the coaches, they're going to want to take a look at Darius Geis and really see what they have in him so they can project out to next year. Obviously, this is a team that's in the middle of a rebuild, right? So they want to know what they've got in this guy. Um, but the only way that I would waste a bench spot on grabbing him now is if you're in a dynasty league that's really large. And I would also wait till he's back on the field and he showed something before you'd waste, a, you know, really is essentially what is a roster spot at this point because Adrian Peterson is playing really well. And I think that he's going to see significant carries even when Darius Geis returns in this one. So that's where it's at. Uh, Peterson's playing really good. The only thing that dampers some of the excitement over what he's done is the return of Darius Geis. Uh, but once again, we'll see. He's been fragile. He hasn't proven much. He's a guy that we are all picking up based on the, potent the potential that we've seen or some of the talk that happened in the preseason the last couple of years. But uh, I guess time would tell. All right, now we're going to talk about Devontae Parker and Preston Williams. And I'm going to tell you right now, I got dynasty fever. I'm excited for next year. It's funny, I'm in a league where I'm currently in first place and I've scored the most fantasy points, and I'm just looking to load my bench for talent for next year. I am almost like, wait, no, I have to stop and focus on winning the championship this year. And uh, Preston Williams is one of those guys that I love. As I look forward to next year, he has got some value. For starters, dare I say that the Dolphins haven't looked as miserable the last few weeks. <laughs> they went on, had that good game against the Jets, and Preston Williams has played good. Now, Williams is 86% available, and Devontae Parker is 67. I forgot to mention that a minute ago, but I thought you guys might want to know. And he is an absolutely, Preston Williams is an absolutely great dynasty stash. He's a big physical wide receiver at six foot five. That's really impressive. Now, when you see wide receivers come in as rookies, oftentimes they can struggle to run sharp enough routes, have good enough hands, be physical enough. There's some things that they really struggle with. He's big enough and physical enough. And that's great. For me, the concern with him was how fast could he be? How quick could he be? How agile? How sharp can his routes be? You know, as a bigger guy, that's harder to do. He's really been developing that over the past few weeks, and he has seen quite a great growth pattern. Um, but I think the biggest sign for me that really makes me like him is they traded away Kenny Stills. I thought that was great. They saying, hey, we like this guy. We like Parker and we like Williams. Uh, we don't think we need a third wide receiver. Let's get something for Kenny Stills. So that for me was a really big confidence boost in how he's been playing. Now he's averaging about four catches and 55 yards per game. And this last game, he added in two touchdowns. Um, what a great game from him. I like him. Now, Devontae Parker is averaging about the same fantasy points per game this season. Preston Williams has been a little bit hotter lately, and I think he's got a lot more upside. So I definitely like Preston Williams more. But Devontae Parker's been good, too. He's got touchdowns in four of the last five games. And uh, the numbers have been pretty effective. In fact, six times in the last eight games, he has scored double-digit fantasy points in PPR leagues. They're almost identical fantasy value, except 
that I think Preston Williams has a much higher ceiling with how young he is and his potential to grow and develop. So I like both these guys. I just like Williams more. Yeah, I'll get to get the uh, Dolphins, by the way. Congratulations, you got your first win. Um, one, I owe uh, Matt O'Connor dinner. Uh, you and your wife said we would take out because I was adamant that they weren't going to win a game all year. And uh, we made a bet, and I lost. So I'll be taking you guys out for dinner. Uh, right now, it looks like the Bengals are probably the worst team in the NFL. They're playing for the number one pick, and a new quarterback at this point anyways. They had played quite a bit better. Miami, mean, look at where they were the first two weeks where they are now. So, Are you sure they don't want to stick with Andy Dalton for another six years and just see? <laughs> oh, it's getting ugly there. Let's talk about Josh Gordon, 45% available out there. And so, of course, you guys all know the news last week. And we even mentioned this was coming. What was basically he recovered from his knee injury, and he was cleared to play. And when that happened, that forced the Patriots to release him according to the NFL's IR rules. They had to release him at that point. Then what happens is teams can put in a claim for him on waivers, and the team with the worst record gets priority. So he could have landed with a team like Miami, Cincinnati, Washington. Uh, they could have easily grabbed him, but he landed in a great spot. I mean, he couldn't be more happy about where he landed at this point with Seattle. And here's why it's great for him. One, okay, they have a great quarterback on the ball. Russell Wilson is having his best statistical season. 20 touchdown passes to one interception. Right now, I, if you're looking at MVP conversation, you got to think, for me, it's got to be Russell Wilson or uh, Christian McCaffrey. And those are the two that really come to mind for me. Uh, Russell's quarterback rating for right now for the year is about 120. He's having a phenomenal year, so that's great. Got a good quarterback there. You need that. Number two, Lockett. Tyler Lockett, you know, we talked about him last year and this year in the preseason. His metrics were off the charts. He's having a great year. One thing we talked about is look, his catch percentage and his quarterback rating when thrown to um, in the last two years are top five in the NFL among all receivers. This guy has been great. Um, his metrics are off the charts, meaning Lockett's going to draw number one coverage. Obviously, he's going to get more and more attention from defenses. He also got Metcalf there. Metcalf is a, a young player, but he's got a lot of skill, a lot of upside. He's very solid. It's going to make it hard for defenses to give too much attention to Josh Gordon in this one. And yet... Um, Josh Gordon's really got a clear path to be the number two and number three um, wide receiver in terms of targets and snaps on that team there. So he's landed in a real good spot there. Now, the one concern I have is obviously the Patriots felt either he lacked something or maybe his knee wasn't going to be 100%. Uh, there's a lot of rumors coming out that they were disappointed maybe in his performance or his work ethic. Something was going on there for the way that played out. Some things that we don't know. Another thing we know about the Patriots is this. They signed Antonio Brown. Of course, they traded for Sanu. And that really showed the Patriots were seeking another quality wide receiver. Obviously, Josh Gordon is not the wide receiver he was back in 2013 for the Browns. So don't look for that. That's not going to happen, obviously. With that said, he's still only 28 years old, right? It hasn't felt like he's been around forever. He's only 28 years old. He's big and physical, 6'3", 225. So maybe the guy's lost his step. A lot of people are saying he looks a little bit slower there. But he still has the ability to go up and contend for tough catches. Uh, he's going to be facing number two and number three corner, which means he's going to find some open space out there. Now, once he builds some rapport, time in with Wilson, learns the offense, I think you're going to see around five to six targets on most Sundays, and he would have wide receiver, th wide receiver three appeal, uh, depending on the matchup or your league size, things like that. But I do think there are weeks that he's going to be valuable for out there, can help you win some games, especially look at week 12, 15, and 16. Those are very friendly wide receiver matchups for him. Uh, those are teams that give a lot of points to wide receivers. Of course, there's always the risk that Josh Gordon slips up again. Uh, you know, comes up with dirty UA, things like that. But he's definitely worth a grab and a stash at this point. Yeah, you know, one of the things I'd like to, to add in there, when this first happened, I thought, he's not going to have huge fantasy value. I thought, they got Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf's playing great. What is he going to do? But then you stop and realize, a guy like Tyler Lockett is a great wide receiver, but he is an extremely efficient wide receiver. He is not getting 12 to 15 targets a game. He's just not. Except for I, last game. Except, yeah. for, except for last game. <laughs> but Somebody's going to kill right. me after that. Yes. Typically, he's not getting yes. 12 to 15 targets a game. And that's from a quarterback who is right now, it's got to be leading the race for MVP. What did he have, like four or five touchdowns today? He was a monster. Russell Wilson has been insane. So, yeah, this is a really good situation to be in, even though I think there are two other good wide receivers there. He definitely has a ceiling because of those other wideouts, um, but he's absolutely worth picking up. Uh, I like him. Uh, I feel like I've said that a lot this video, and he's in the video, so maybe that's obvious at this point, but I guess I'm just affirming what you're saying. All right, so let's get to some running backs, Devin Singletary and Frank Gore. Now, the first thing I got to say is um, I got to give you credit, Rob. You predicted it last week when you said Devin Singletary was going to get more carries. Sure enough, he got a lot more carries. He got 20 carries. So it was a lot of carries that game. It was a good game for him. Um, he had 20 carries, 95 rushing yards, plus three catches for 45 receiving yards. He added two touchdowns. He looks great. This is a big sigh of relief for me right now because I drafted him in Keeper League, and he just hadn't quite been the running back that I was expecting him to be. Um, but he really stepped things up. I think that he was slow coming in. 
um, because Frank Gore was running the ball well at the beginning of the season, and so he had to really earn his time to beat out that veteran. That's I mean, that's the way coaches are, especially those old school guys will just give the veteran the ball more. That's the way it is. And but that that taking over the role thing took some time because he missed so many weeks. Anyways. They got a good matchup this week. The Browns give the fifth most fantasy points to running backs. Like I said, he has looked great. Now, uh, at 5'7", 203 pounds, I don't think this is a guy who's going to get 20 carries a game. That seems high to me, at least as of this season, as of right now with Frank Gore there. But he looks good, and, and I think what's even more important to his fantasy value going forward, which I think could, could continue to be on this sort of pace, maybe not over 100 yards every game and two touchdowns, but is just the fact that Frank Gore has been not so effective recently. He's a guy who started the year great, but it seems like midway through the years when his age hit him. 36 years old, first few games, he looked awesome. He's slowed down and let's look at some of the numbers so between weeks two and five he was averaging 16 carries per game the last three games that's just 10.3 so he's getting almost six less carries a game that's basically a third of the carries completely taken off right there but now he's beginning less carries his carries have been less efficient he went from 5.8 yards per carry um, towards the beginning of the season down to just 3.35 so i definitely see this trend continuing maybe not further again i don't think he's going to be a guy who's getting 25 touches a game but i definitely see continuing the value leaning more towards devin singletary yeah devin singletary his size his skill set the way that he plays reminds me an awful lot of bill Lindsay, right and uh you know phil Lindsay today played the browns and he had a really good game you know so i i think you know maybe that's some indication that uh, he'll do well against them so so I want to talk about Jalen Samuels, 32% available, and I want to talk about Trey Edmonds, 99% available, the running backs for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'll talk about them real quickly. Next week, they play the Rams, allowing you 13 fewest points to running backs. So the value of Samuels, he's a guy you need to pick up. What you know, what, what do you see him moving forward? What's his role going to be there? Well, a lot of that's going to depend upon how we answer the question of how serious is James Conner's injury and how much time does he miss? And uh, we just talked about it a little bit ago, but I tell you what, I hope James Conner comes back very soon. I've got him in three leagues. I don't have a lot of running back depth. I've had some injuries there. Um, him being out is killing me. Uh, so I hope that he comes back. But it's been Adam Scheffner reports that Conner is in jeopardy of missing Pittsburgh's Week 10 matchup against the Rams. So uh, as of now, if you and Jalen Samuels look like you may be able to use him one more week and he would have value there for you. Now, last week we said it that... Uh, you know, you look at Jalen Samuels, he's not a good peer runner like James Conner. Those are different backs there. He's not as a good peer runner. And today he showed it. He had eight carries for 10 yards, 1.3 yards per carry. On the year, his yards per carry, 2.31. That part of his game, Samuels' game is deficient. It just is. Okay, there's no comparison. James Conner's just much better running the ball there. But we've also said on many times that Jalen has excellent hands. In fact, when he was drafted and came into the NFL, a lot of people speculated he would become a tight end because that's how good his hands are. And he showed off those hands today. He had 13 catches for 73 yards, and those hands that he has make him very safe and solid playing PPR leagues. Even if the rushing yards are low, it doesn't matter. He's going to offset that with a lot of catches, and he's going to keep his value high. Now, if you own James Conner, you got to handcuff him. In fact, I tried really hard this week to handcuff him. I offered this guy a ton of stuff to basically rent Jalen Samuels for one game because I got James Conner. So I thought, I'll get Samuels, play him for a game. He'll go to my bench as a handcuff. And I try to give him a ton. No matter what I try to offer this guy, he would not bite. But if you own James Conner, you got to handcuff him with Samuels. Okay, he's going to help you uh, uh, maybe win a game. Now, once Conner returns, um, you look at his usage. I would imagine once James Conner returns, Samuels is going to maybe get um, eight to nine touches per game. Now, because Samuels was ineffective running the ball today, Trey Edmonds got carries, and he looked solid. Today he had 12 carries for 73 yards. Now, if you look at Trey, he's been in the league three seasons. He was undrafted. He has a very limited value. Okay, let's not get too excited there. When you look at if I'm the Steelers moving forward, obviously I want to get Jalen Samuels moving. I want him to run the ball. I want to get him effective because if he can run the ball effectively while James Conner is out, that's going to give me more options on offense because he's got uh, better hands. Um, he can be out on all three downs there. So that's what they're going to prefer to do. Now, they want to get the ground game going, like I said, using Jalen Samuels. Um, then you add to the fact that Connor's going to be back soon. I wouldn't wash out. I wouldn't uh, grab Trey. I don't think that he's got a lot of value. Don't get too excited by this. And if he does have value, it's only if um, Connor's out in very large leagues and we have to be standard league scoring. So uh, he's not a guy that I would get too concerned with at this point. Any thoughts? Yeah, I do. Um, one thought. It's just weird to think this guy had more catches than he had rushing yards. I don't know the last time a running back did that is, but you don't see it too often. Um, he is on the far end of PPR specific, of receiving running back. It's really interesting. Um, and that, for me, shows a lot of confidence. I, um, at least for me, in that when 
James Conner comes back, he's going to be the guy. And no matter how well you catch the ball, he's running the ball so ineffectively that when James Conner comes back, he's going to be the sole back in the backfield. And there's no concern in that. Um, but, yeah, that is just a weird situation. I don't know the last time I saw something like that happen. Yeah. But I do like Jalen Samuels one more week. I think he's going to get one more start. I think they'll keep James Conner out there, but uh, hopefully not. All right, so now I want to talk about the Lions running back situation just to address a couple of things briefly. One being the performance of Ty Johnson has been a disappointment. Is not a guy I'd be picking up off the waivers at this point. Um, one of the biggest reasons for that is running back Jay Ajayi. It sounds like the Lions have some interest in him. Now, they currently haven't signed him, at least as of the second of recording this video. It seems like at least once per video, something happens during the uploading phase, and then somebody's like, this guy does two play for them, and it's like, okay, well. But anyways, as of right now, he hasn't signed with them, uh, but it sounds like they plan on and have worked him out, and they want to uh, see what he can do with them. They need a running back. They are desperate. Jay Ajayi is a guy to consider. Now, I'd love to do a segment or an own, like, video once a week called radar or roster right when we do this waiver wire video is he a guy to roster or is he a guy to just keep on your radar jhi is a guy to keep on your radar i don't think he i don't think i'm going to be super excited right now i don't think that he's got a huge a lot of value i think his career was completely derailed by that acl tear however he's had a lot of time to recover from that i have to feel like he's been recovered and if he does sign with the lions he could have some value there's no guarantee that he is going to sign with the Lions, though. Heck, even the Cardinals worked this guy out and opted to pick up Zach Zenner and Alfred Morris, a team that at the time seemed pretty desperate for a running back. So I definitely think that you have to consider keeping your eye on this dude, but definitely don't waste a roster spot on him. I think right now there's some better options. Let's talk about Damian Williams. Uh, hard to talk about. I'm a Vikings fan, and today I thought we had the win. Of course, uh, Green Bay loses. or a great opportunity to be tied for first pay place, and uh, that kind of broke my heart. And he's one of the guys that broke my heart today. Uh, he is 29% available, basically 30% available out there, third of the leagues. First of the Titans next week. The Titans give up the 11th fewest points to backs. Now let's take a look at this running back situation for the Chiefs there. You look at LaShawn McCoy, he'd really taken hold of that running back role. That was his team, uh, but he fumbled in week eight, and that really opened the door for Williams to get touches. And he's taken advantage of that, and he's looked decent. Now, today he had a big run, 91-yard touchdown run. He led Kansas City in carries. Um, he's had back-to-back -back week with touchdowns. Here's my concern. Here's why I'm not ready to jump on the Williams bandwagon just yet. Okay? Here's why. Take away that 91-yard, okay, and you look at his entire year, um, minus that one carry, he's at 134 rushing yards at a 2.74 yards per carry. That's the same reason why McCoy really kind of won that job before he had fumbling issues and couldn't hold on to the ball there. McCoy, for the year, has been by far the more effective and efficient back. His yards per carry are over five. Um, now, what I think is gonna happen is I think Williams can keep a, what I would call a significant role. I think he's gonna see carries. I think he's gonna see targets in the passing game there. But what I'm afraid is what's gonna happen is Coach Reed is gonna go with the hot hand. And, uh, and so from week to week, unless one of those guys gets injured, it's gonna be hard if you know which one you can trust, hard to know who to start there. He's a guy that I would stash on your bench if you are in a big league and you have some uh, what I would call a deep bench and you have some running back needs. But don't pick him up and think he's going to duplicate what he did last week and all of a sudden he's going to become the go-to guy and get 15, 20 carries per game. I simply don't see that being the case there. I think they're going to continue using the hot hand. And they, they have another back there too uh, that they use from time to time. So once again, it's getting pretty complicated there. And I think there's another guy that you had. You have both those, I think, early in the year. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you got some complicated running back things. What you a very of. weird running back situation. I'm in a league where I've got David Johnson. That's a whole mess. And I've got Damian Williams and LaShawn McCoy. We've got uh, David Montgomery and uh, Devin Singletary, both guys who started slow, but they're getting hot. It's a weird situation for me. But anyways, what I want to add to that is I think fumbles are forgettable. I really do. You look at a team like the New England Patriots, they are historically tough on their running backs. Fumbles would get you taken out in a second. But you know what? Sonny Michaud had some fumbling issues last year, and he's getting a boatload of carries now. Why is that? Because James White's yards per carry is worse. He's not as effective of a runner. And in the long run, I think yards per carry is what matter. I think the efficiency in the ground game is, is going to matter. They're going to forget LaShawn McCoy's fumbles at some point. They're going to feel safe with him again, and he's going to have some value there. I think at this point, we've reached a point where it's clear LaShawn McCoy will not be the clear starter. That just doesn't seem like it's going to happen this year. I'd be shocked. But I also don't see it going the other way. I'm not on this super big hype train with Damian Williams right now. I still think he I think he holds a little bit more value than Sean McCoy. But again, it is a situation that is they've got enough value, you have to roster them, but I don't trust them in my lineups. I trust them in my roster on my bench. Yeah, you'd say this. Uh, you never want a guy to get hurt, but you really need an injury there. 
in, for one of those backs to clear things up. But that's why you put them on your uh, bench because you never know. All it takes is one play, one bad knee, a pop, a twist, something like that. And before you know it, you got yourself a great back. So. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, Ronald Jones Jr. and Peyton Barber. I don't, I don't like, I don't know what to say because they've yeah. been so ineffective. But both of them are 60% available or more, and it's like hard for me not to talk about these guys. It's hard for us to completely ignore an entire team's running back situation. Peyton Barber has been brutal. Ronald Jones Jr. has been bad. Ronald Jones Jr. has been bad. But like I just said, he's been probably a little bit better than Peyton Barber. Um, he's outperformed him, but he still doesn't look great. He still doesn't look highly effective. He is 60% available. Honestly, the way, and I've looked at some rosters in the teams, in the leagues that I am in, and just saying, hey, why don't you pick up this guy? Because he's at least worth a bench spot for your running backs. He's far from great, but they do play the Cardinals game, the 15th most fantasy points to running backs this week. This goes to kind of with the Damian Williams thing. I think you got to roster them, but I would feel very uncomfortable with them in my lineup. But you're not just going to let talent sit out there. Although I guess the one argument for keeping these guys unrostered is that I don't think either of them has huge upside. So they kind of are what they are at this point. Mm -hmm. And that makes me very nervous. And then I guess you also throw in the fact that PPR leagues, neither of them are great PPR backs. And geez, why we even talk about them, forget about them at this point. But that's where I'm at with that. We do want to mention them because they're so highly available. But they're not great, probably worth rostering, but definitely not playing. Yeah, the one thing that I think is going to happen with that situation there is I think when it comes right down to it, we've seen uh, obviously with Barber, he is what he is. He's got a low uh, ceiling, a low floor. Mm -hmm. um, he's just kind of a, a plow, you know, a yeah. running back in terms of how you want to describe him. But I do think that Ron Jones has a little more upside. He's younger, and mm -hmm. I think his year goes on, and of course we know Tampa Bay is not going to make the postseason there. I think they might give him some more carries just to see what they have in him looking ahead to maybe next year. So maybe uh, uh, later, but once again, that's tough because if they start getting more carries in your, in your fantasy playoffs, are you going to trust Ron? Ronald Jones, hopefully not. Hopefully you don't have to, but you may have to. You never know when you have injuries. So once again, right now, I won't trust these guys, but you also can't ignore me either because running backs are hard to find. Let's talk about Jameis Winston, 22% available versus the Cardinals, allowing the most points to quarterbacks. Let's talk about Jimmy Garoppolo versus the Cardinals, right? Going into that game, Jimmy Garoppolo had been averaging 1.3 touchdown passes per game and only 212 passing yards per game, and he dismantled them for four touchdown passes and 300 yards. Uh, he made it look easy versus them. Now, today, Winston goes out, and he has a good game versus Seattle. He's over 20 fantasy points scored. Now, in most scoring systems, Winston is averaging about 24 points per game on the year. Since week two, he's averaging about 27 fantasy points per game on the year. Even with his turnovers and sloppy quarterback play, his fantasy value is huge. I'm going to say that again. I don't care about what kind of quarterback he is. I don't care if he's a franchise quarterback. I don't care if he's next to John Montana or if he's horrible. His fantasy value is high. That's what we're looking at. This is fantasy football we're talking about here, right? We always hear it from somebody. He sucks as Would a Would you see that Brashad Perryman touchdown this week? He basically threw an interception, and he still got the touchdown out of it. At this point, his wide receivers are so good that he could just be the worst quarterback in the league. I don't care if he's Vinny Testaverde. The guy's going to get a touchdown. He just throws it up, and Mike Evans pulls it down. Yeah. Or Chris Godwin pulls it down, or somebody pulls it down. Sorry to interrupt. But That's all right. When it comes to fantasy, volume and opportunity matter, right? Currently, did you know right now, he sits as the ninth fantasy quarterback in terms of average points per game. Ninth. You know, a lot of people thought how horrible he was. People don't want to touch this guy early in the year, but right now he's the ninth quarterback. Five times this year he's out thrown over 300 yards passing. And why? Due to two things. A poor running game. We just talked about that. And also the fact that his defense is bad. Tampa Bay's defense is not good. In fact, currently the Bucks are 31st in the NFL, allowing 31.5 points per game. He has to throw early and often just to keep them in the game. Overlook him as a quarterback and look at him through the lens of fantasy football and trust this guy. He's going to win you some games. Another quarterback you got to consider at 22% available is Phillip Rivers. Very good plug and play this week. Not huge on him every week, um, but I do like him. And here's the breakdown. I want to start off with the bad first. The bad being since Melvin Gordon has been back, they like to lean on their one-two punch of Gordon and Eckler. And they've been using their running game more than they were when it was just Eckler. But that's it for bad news for him. The good news for him is that he plays Oakland, giving the third most fantasy points to quarterbacks. Uh, but that's not just how bad they've been. They've been bad even more lately. Of the last three teams that they have played or the last three quarterbacks that they have faced, two of them have thrown over 400 yards. I mean, that, that's not just 300 yards. That's 400 yards. That is ridiculous. 
and those three quarterbacks have combined for 11 touchdown passes to just one interception during that span. The only two quarterbacks to not have good fantasy days against the Raiders this year, Chase Daniels and a brutal Bears offense. I'm sorry, Bears fans. You guys got some things to work out there, but at least you got a great defense and your young running back is looking good, David Montgomery. Um, and then Kirk Cousins. The Vikings just stomped the Raiders and Kirk Cousins didn't throw the ball very much at least. And so I think this is a great matchup for him. And not to mention, he's got Keenan Allen, he's got Mike Williams, he's got Hunter Henry and Austin Eckler out of the backfield. He's got great weapons. You can't argue with the weapons. I'm going to keep things short and wrap it up now by saying Philip Rivers is a good play this week. Talk about Josh Allen, 22% available, plays the Browns along the 12th most points to quarterbacks there. Uh, third game in a row is over 20 fantasy points per game. Sixth time this year he's done that. The only bad game he's has versus the Patriots, and my note going in tonight I said, um, and everybody struggles against the Patriots, but then I had to add this caveat there, except for Lamar Jackson and the Ravens, right? Um, but other than that, once again, uh, the Patriots are good, and he's done really well. Uh, there's nothing flashy about his game. There isn't. I mean, you watch this guy. He doesn't look great, but he gets it done. He puts up good numbers. I think one of the things that maintains his value is his legs. He had a rushing touchdown today, and those are the things that you don't see, but they keep his fantasy numbers up there. Uh, Josh Allen is a solid play if you need someone. Well, you know what I'd love to throw into that? Who is the one quarterback who's played well against the Patriots? Lamar Jackson, a guy who's known for his legs. And I think that is probably, at least from what we saw today, a really big key in being able to attack that Patriots team is having a quarterback who can be mobile, buy time, and even run if you need to. All right, now I'd like to talk about Jimmy Garoppolo at 34% available as a guy you could, should consider this week. Now, if you've looked at his stats from this season as a whole, he's not a guy you should start every week. But as a plug and play option this week, I do actually like him. The breakdown is that he plays Seattle along the 11th most fantasy points to quarterbacks. That's good news. Heck, they just had a good day, or Jameis Winston just had a good day against the Seattle Seahawks, and I believe Seattle barely pulled out that win in OT, and so that is definitely something to consider. Now, when we break some of this down, I don't think he's great. One of my concerns for him is that he's not always going to have a lot of volume. That team runs the ball pretty well, actually very well as a team at least, and their defense is good. So this is not a guy who's going to consistently throw the ball 45 times a game. But when he does throw the ball, at least last game showed us he can be very effective. I trust him a lot more now that he's got Emmanuel Sanders. Yeah. We haven't seen a whole lot of Emmanuel Sanders on that team, but man, that seemed night and day with Emmanuel Sanders in last week. Um, he looks to really be developing well into that offense, and I've got a lot more confidence in Jimmy Garoppolo's value now that he has a legitimate wide receiver one, because if we're being honest, his other wide receivers stink. They're garbage. And it was like, okay, let's just find a way to cover George Kittle, the tight end, and we'll be good in the passing game, and we'll worry about the running game. It's not that way anymore. He's got a good wide receiver, so I do love him in this matchup this week versus the Seahawks. Let's talk about uh, Jacoby Brissett, 41% available. He's got a great matchup this week playing Miami, allowing the fourth most points to quarterbacks. But today, he got injured. Uh, looked like he injured his knee, his ankle. Sounds like the worst of his maybe his knee. He got rolled up on by a player there. Brian Hoyer came in the game, and he didn't come back there. Um, if he can go next week, I think he's got a solid matchup against a bad Miami defense. But here's the thing, and once again, we're going to have to watch injury reports to see how this week develops there. If I'm the Colts, I think I can beat Miami with Hoyer, a quarterback. There's a veteran. I think he'll do just enough for you to be able to win. Why would you risk Brissett, um, who's going to be really, and he is at this point your franchise quarterback, why would you risk him? But here's what we need to do. Before we make any assumptions about his value, we need to look at the injury aftermath, you know, on Monday, Tuesday, maybe even into Wednesday before making any assumptions about his value. But if there are any uncertainties about his availability and his health and what he can do, his mobility, things like that, there are probably enough streaming options available this week that I probably wouldn't take any chances with him. Once again, going into this week before I get injured at that, man, that's a great, you got to play per set against Miami. But now uh, with the injury there, we're going to have to assess that. We're we'll reevaluate. We'll try to put a video out on Friday and give you some updates on that. All right, so I'm going to talk about Daniel Jones. He is 75% available. And that high availability is the reason we're going to talk about him. I'm not huge on Daniel Jones. But we do want to give an option out there that is more available than some of the last guys we've talked about. You guys, you're in, some of you are in 16-team leagues. Some of you are in two-quarterback leagues. And this is the sort. those are the sort of leagues that you should consider him in. I do like this guy because he's had some big games. And there's some real high upside with his weapons there. Uh, but he's also had some very, very bad games. Like against Tampa Bay, he had three touchdown passes, 329 passing yards. He looked great. 
He also had like a four game stretch where he was brutal and you just had to completely avoid that guy. Now, today the Jets, they allowed Ryan Fitzpatrick and the Dolphins to have a very nice day against him, uh, or against the Jets defense, excuse me, and Daniel Jones will be playing the Jets heading into this week, so that could very well be a good matchup. There's so much inconsistency with him that I wouldn't play him unless you're in a deep league, two quarterback league. Like I mentioned, I already mentioned it. Um, he's very athletic. He's got some high upside. Two rushing touchdowns on the year is great, but I don't trust him. So you have to be in those sort of leagues to play him. Another guy that uh, you can maybe look at but carry some risk is Ryan Tannehill, 81% available. Versus Kansas City next week, allowing the ninth most points to quarterbacks. Now, he's uh, scored 20 fantasy points per game last three starts that he started. Uh, if you watch him, he hasn't been pretty, but he's clearly better than Marcus Mariota. Uh, pretty or not, fantasy points are fantasy points, right? Um, you don't get anything extra for style in this one. Um, I think the thing that's going to bode well for him is Pat Mahomes sounds like he's going to be back for this game. That Kansas City offense is going to score more points, and that's going to force Ryan to have to play catch-up, so he might be a nice volume play in this one. If you're doing daily fantasy, if you're in a two-quarterback league, whatever it might be, once again, he does carry some risk there, but I do think he's got a nice matchup. All right, guys, I'd like to talk briefly about Jamal Williams. Now, he is 28% available, and I think you should consider him as a guy to pick up. But when should you consider him? I think that it's very important that the right people pick him up with the right rosters. I think a lot of people could pick him up and he'd be a waste in a guy who just sit in your bench and have no value. Where he does have value is as a very good handcuff to Aaron Jones. I'll say this right now, guys. Aaron Jones is the guy in that offense. He is the runner. We're just simply not seeing a lot of carries from Jamal Williams. I think the Packers organization, Matt LaFleur, they're really starting to realize that. Um, there was that game when he first came back where he carried the ball out and he carried it well, but then we really bounced back to normal. Over the last three games, he's averaging just four carries a game and just eight touches a game. That's very uh, interesting because the production has been there. He's got five touchdowns in the last four games. You'd think with all those touchdowns that if he was really going to become the guy, they'd start to give him more carries. I think that they see that he's a very good piece in that offense, that he's very good in the passing game, but Aaron Jones is still the guy. Also, you identify five of those touchdowns, four of them were in the passing game. I think he's a good change of pace back. I think that he's a good third down receiving back. But I still think Aaron Jones is the guy. And let's not forget, Aaron Jones has had some big weeks in the passing game. I don't know how many weeks ago it was, but there was a game somewhat recently. He had like 75 receiving yards, something like that. I'm not going to quote exactly because ultimately it doesn't matter. Aaron Jones is not inept in the passing game. Oh, last week he had, I was like over 150 receiving yards. You're right. That sounds huge. So for me, I think he holds a great spot as a handcuff, but for other rosters, I don't see a whole lot of value for him because I don't see enough upside with the amount of touches he's getting. That's all I got to say on him. If you guys want to complain about that pick, I know some people love Jamal Williams. You go ahead and do that, but that's where I'm at with it right now. Yeah, I think some people might say, well, look at Aaron Jones. They didn't have a lot of carries there, but that was a game. It was about game script, game flow, for example. They just fell behind in this one, and they couldn't really run the ball that much. Uh, you know, I don't know what happened. The, the Packers, which have surprised me all year and looked great, looked terrible there playing the Chargers today. But I think you're right. Typically speaking, um, Aaron Jones is a much better pure runner. All right, so now I like to talk about uh, Mike Williams. If I can find my notes here, I'm a little bit disorganized. 21% uh, available. I like him. I think you should pick him up. He's got Phillip Rivers. Phillip Rivers is a good quarterback, and that has showed. Um, since the bye week, he's averaging 75 receiving yards per game. That is pretty solid numbers. I like that. I mean, that's just hard to argue with. I think that there are some very good wide receivers out there who aren't even averaging 75 receiving yards a game. On the flip side, the touchdowns really aren't there, and that's a that is a concern. Um, it definitely is. In standard leagues, he takes a hit. That's ultimately because you got Melvin Gordon, Austin Eckler, Hunter Henry, and Keenan Allen. There's just so many weapons to go around there. He does benefit from a defense that is less than great, um, that hasn't been fantastic this season, and has given up some points. Um, as far as starting him goes, which this isn't a start-sit video, but I always have to happen to go into start-sit. I guess that's just the way that uh, my lens is and the way that I think about things. And in, as far as start sit perspective goes, he's got a great matchup against Oakland, giving the six most fantasy points to wide receivers. So that does give him a boost where we could see, hey, if he does something this week, he could find the end zone this week. But um, he's not inept. He's not bad at scoring touchdowns. He had like 11, 10 or 11 touchdowns last year. So he's not a guy who can't do it. It's just that maybe there are a bit too many mouths to feed. You're leaning in. You got to say something about that, or does no, breakdown no, seem pretty just, yeah, simple? Yeah, it's a pretty simple breakdown. Like I said, I think it's very solid. I think it's a nice safe floor, but a lower ceiling. 
Let's talk about wide receiver. Christian Kirk, who's 28% available out there. This week he plays Tampa Bay, giving up the second most points to wide receivers. Now, he disappointed someone last week, but he plays the 49ers. And they got some good cornerbacks, some good uh, defensive uh, backs there, and so that was kind of a rough day for him. Let's take a look at what uh, wide receiver did today versus Tampa Bay. You look at Metcalf and Lockett, they had their way with them. Uh, they had a huge game. In fact, wide receivers have all year versus Tampa Bay. Once again, they're going to have the second most points to wide receivers. In games that Christian Kirk has been fully healthy, okay, not injured, banged up, he's been fully healthy. He's averaging 9.6 targets per game. You need to pick him up and play him this week. He's got a great matchup. He's got a very strong, strong wide receiver three play or flex play this week. All right, so now we're going to talk about the Jets situation of wide receivers we got robbie anderson jamison crowder demarius thomas i'm i'm gonna i guess um i'm gonna plagiarize you rob i love the phrase that you use feels like playing russian roulette that, that's just what i feel like at this point i don't feel any comfortable with the un, any comfortability with them from week to week at least before i used to feel like hey they had that good game against dallas maybe that team's really turning it around and then you go and lose to Miami, and that just ruined all the confidence that I had, which wasn't much at this point. Um, you look at a guy like Robbie Anderson. For years, he's supposed to break out, and it hasn't happened. We got Jamison Crowder. He's had three good games this year. He's had three very good games. But in the other five, he's averaging just three catches and 25 yards. Demarius Thomas, this is a guy who almost left the team and sounds like he was going to bounce around. In fact, he's already been bounced around. He's a journeyman and really comes in seemingly as the wide receiver three right now. I mean, when we break down this whole situation, they have a good matchup against the Giants this week, but that good matchup really isn't enough for me to justify it. Now, as I said earlier with the Bucks running back situation, I'll say the same thing with the Jets receiving situation. You can't completely ignore a team situation like that. I think there's got to be some value held there. I think there's got to be some consideration. They've got to be on your radar. In deep leagues, guy like Robbie Anderson and Jamison Crowder, especially in PPR, they're worth picking up. In, in smaller leagues, if you're saying a 10-team, 8-team league, I don't imagine that they hold enough value for you to keep on your roster at this point. But that is very specific to the league that you're in, so I don't want to speak too much to that. But man, Russian roulette, that has got to be just the catchphrase for that team right now. So I'll talk to you about Marquise Brown, 31% available. Uh, before I get to the breakdown of his value and what we think of him, um, let's go back to week one and week two. A lot of the listeners lost your mind at us, and you couldn't believe us. You were appalled when we didn't overreact to Brown's value. And we went on. I remember what we said. We went on there and said, hey, he had a huge week one, but some of that was what we call bad tackling, bad defense gets mine. I mean, that contributed to his fast starts. You know, he had five catches and kind of blew up. And I also think that he's not in a great system as far as – production for him to be effective and have huge fantasy numbers. Lamar Jackson is a great athlete. I'm going to say that again. Lamar Jackson is a phenomenal athlete, one of the best that we have seen in a long, long time. we got to go back to Michael Vick to find a wide receiver that had that sort of impact with his legs. But he's still not a great quarterback. Okay, uh, Some people are not like that comment, but break it down to once again. Great athlete, great runner, probably not a great quarterback. Obviously, he's talented, and so is Brown. But this offense is not predicated on pushing the ball downfield to the wide receivers. They use their tight ends a lot. They like to run a lot, use motion. They make short throws, high percentage plays, things like that. So when you look at Brown's value, um, if you take away that week one, look at the rest of his numbers, he's going to be a wide receiver. He's going to be a wide receiver three or four, depending on your league size and matchup. But generally speaking, he's going to be a wide receiver four that you're not going to play all that much. Now, this week he plays Cincinnati. They're allowing the 11th fewest points to wide receivers. But that's kind of deceiving. I'll tell you why that number is deceiving. 11th fewest points looks like, hey, they're tough against wide receivers. But they're actually the worst run defense in the NFL right now, the Cincinnati Bengals are. 32nd in the NFL line, 177 rushing yards per game. They give up a ton of rushing yards. So what's happening there is when teams play them, the reason why they're not giving a lot of points to wide receivers, they don't need to throw the ball off. And um, they can just run the field. That defensive back field for the Bengals is not very good there. They can be exposed. One concern I have with this matchup going forward is that the question I have is how many targets is Brown going to get in a game that most people expect the Ravens are going to blow them out. So there could be another one where it's a blowout. They're not going to need to throw the ball that much there. So right this week, uh, definitely pick him up. He's got that sort of talent. You can't leave him out there in waiver wire. He's back. He is healthy. Uh, but don't pick him up expecting him to do what he did back in week one or week two. Mm-hmm. Well, I talked about the Giants wide receivers. Sterling Shepard, 34% available. Golden Tate, 21% available. And Darius Slayton, 30, or 93% available. Uh, next week, they play the Jets. Give up the seventh most points to wide receivers. Now, Shepard, Stone Shepard, appeared ready to play Monday night. Earlier this week, he had shed his non-contact jersey because he's been on a concussion protocol, right? But on Sunday, they ruled him out for Monday. It's not good. That's concerning there. He's had uh, two concussions early this year. And with the NFL being hypersensitive to CTE and concussions, 
this is getting to be a, a somewhat concerning situation for Sterling Shepard. Um, not only his play this year, his owners, things like that. We keep expecting any week he's going to be back now. I think it's now the fourth week in a row that he has missed. Um, and I kind of downgraded Gold Tate's value and Slayton's value because we expected any moment he's going to be back and they become the number two, number three guys there. But I'm starting to think this concussion thing is going to drag on for him and maybe affect his whole season at this point. That means those guys, you have to begin to really look at Golden Tate and some of their value. Talking about Golden Tate, when he first arrived first week versus the or I'm sorry, versus the Vikings, he had a very quiet week versus us. Didn't do a whole lot. I say us because if you don't know, I'm a Vikings fan. I live in Minnesota. Um, after that week, he's been very good. Since then, he's averaging 6.7 catches and 89 yards per game. That's very solid. He's a must grab. He's a strong wide receiver play if Shepard misses a game. If Shepard sits, he's a guy that's very high end wide receiver three. Um, now, should you pick him up or do you play him? Obviously, there's so much that varies. You have to look at your league size, bench depth, things like that. Will obviously determine his value if Shepard's back there. But with Shepard out, you're going to play Golden Tate every week at this point. Slayton, uh, that role is rookie. Uh, the rookie's role has increased. You look at the first two games, he didn't get any catches there. I don't think he even got any targets. But his year's gone on. He started to have some targets. He's made some athletic catches. He's got three touchdowns on the year. Concern I have is you got Golden Tate there, Ingram, and Barkley. Um, and then, of course, you have Sterling Shepard coming back. Those touches are going to be inconsistent. He's really hard to trust week to week. I would say you need to uh, really wait and watch on him. Yeah, you know, the one thing I, I'd like to say about Slayton in kind of defense of his value, the, one of the reasons I think he's got some value is – when you break it down, he's the one wide receiver. He's the one guy in that team that can do something that the other ones can't. Golden Tate, Evan Ingram, Saquon Barkley. You look at all three of those guys. Of course, you talk about Sterling Shepard not being playing or whatever. Um, he's really the one deep threat. Golden Tate is a good possession wide receiver, but he's not a burning speedster. He's not just going to totally torture a cornerback. Um, Barkley's not going to do out of the backfield. Never even was a great tight end, but he's a tight end. He's not the guy that you're just going to run a fly out and say burn the safety, right? So I think he holds some role as really having a unique identity on that team. The other thing I want to say is uh, Sterling Shepard is starting to make me nervous and actually starting to remind me of Wes Welker, a very good wide receiver whose career just got ruined towards the end with concussions and is definitely making me very nervous. Not nervous enough that I think his career is over, but yeah, there's definitely some concern and some caution there that needs to be had. All right, so let's talk about A.J. Brown, plain and simple. He is 88% available, and I don't think he has huge value, but he's a good dynasty stash. Here's why. Now, we've talked about he's had some very good games, and he's looked good. He has looked better since Ryan Tannehill has taken over, and he is a rookie who is developing. That's all good news and makes him a good dynasty stash. The bad news being his production hasn't been phenomenal because that offense just isn't scoring a lot of points. He's scored in only two games this year, and his yards have been very inconsistent, and that's what makes me the most nervous. Um, here is week to week the amount of receiving yards that he has had this year so far. 100. 25, 4, 94, 27, 23, 64, 11, and 81. Um, that is just like, yeah, you could maybe get a great week from him where he has 80 to 90 receiving yards and a touchdown. But you could also have a week where he, you know, like week three had four receiving yards. Like there's just so much inconsistency with him um, that unless you're picking up in a dynasty league, I honestly have some concerns about rostering him because... Now, of course, in deep leagues, that completely changes. But say in a 12-team league, I think there are a lot of guys who have more immediate value. And if you're not in a dynasty league, immediate value is what you want. You don't care about what he could do two years from now. But that's my breakdown for AJ Brown. I got nothing more to say on it. So if you got any questions, I could definitely talk about it more. But this video is getting long. And uh, I believe the last guy I'm going to talk about is DK Metcalf. Now, he's 23% available, and he has been on fire. Um Versus San Francisco this week, that is a good team, but he's been really great. Uh, San Francisco gives up the third fewest fantasy points to wide receivers. That is going to knock his value a little bit, so I don't think he's maybe going to have a monster week next week, um, but I just, DK Metcalf, he's been so effective, we can't not talk about him. 23% available is not super highly available. He's got five touchdowns on the year. Three of his touchdowns have come in the last two games. He's got an MVP quarterback in Russell Wilson that I absolutely love. Uh, he's been great. And I think it's one of those situations where he's just been, I mean, a stud guy. When you look at um, Tyler Lockett, has been, again, very great guy. He makes some big plays, but he's not, other than this last game, as we talked about earlier, a guy who's going to get tons of volume of targets. Sort of the possession wide receiver this year has been DK Metcalf. And he's also been good in the red zone. And for a rookie to do that, a rookie who has got a great quarterback, I like this guy. Now, 
He does take a hit because they signed Josh Gordon, but I think he's going to maintain at least by at least by a little bit, at least kind of edging out Josh Gordon as the number two wideout right now. And like I said earlier, the way that team has been, I don't think he's going to take a massive hit. Talk about Alan Lazard, 89% available. Next week he plays Carolina, allowing the ninth most points to wide receiver. So in recent weeks he's actually outsnapped Ronald Allison, Marquez Valdez, Scantling. This guy is huge, six foot five. The rookie has a lot of good upside. I like this guy quite a bit. Now he's been efficient too. He's converted 85% of the throws that have come his way. That's ninth in the NFL during the last four week span where he's really been seeing significant action there. Now with Devontae Adams back, I think it might open some things up there for him a little bit. Of course, Devontae Adams is the number one guy there. Clearly going to get a lot of targets, a lot of attention from defenses. But I think that Allen's going to settle into the number two role on that team. We've said for a couple weeks here, this is the guy, okay? Um, in fact, if I was you, I wouldn't waste your time chasing Allison or Marcus Valdez-Scantling. Uh, you can just forget those guys. I think he's the guy that I would put my money on there. Uh, one of the things I like about him is actually Aaron Rodgers. What got him out in the field and started getting him some use and targets was uh, Aaron Rodgers really started to pull up for him to get playing time. You love when a quarterback does that, especially someone like Aaron Rodgers. Sure, he's got confidence. He likes what you're doing there. I think this guy's responded really well. Uh, today versus the Chargers, he led the Packers in receiving, and that was after Adams uh, came back today. And on the field, obviously, Devonta Adams is going to be the number one guy, but it seems to me he's becoming clearly the number two guy in that offense. I think that's going to continue to grow. He's going to continue to solidify his role there. I like this guy moving forward, and, uh, going back again to a lot of what we said today. I like his dynasty value, too. Yeah, I mean, what not to like about this guy? He started the year super slow, but that's because he wasn't getting snaps. And the Packers' offense was a little bit slow. Aaron Rodgers was not there, and Rodgers we knew in the past. But Rodgers has been heating up, and you work into that role. And we talked about this offseason, not so much since the season has started. Um, but Aaron Rodgers' number two wide receivers, heck, even their number three, traditionally throughout most years have always been great guys. And so, I, I mean, all around, I like this guy. I don't know if there's something to dislike about him at this point. He's a big guy, and he's just great wide receiver, huge upside. Some about the Vikings wide receivers, oh, BZ Johnson or BC Johnson, I think they say 97% available, and Laquan Treadwell was like 99% available out there. Addison re-aggravated his leg injury today. Next week, they play the Dallas Cowboys. Now, if you look at uh, Johnson, I think Johnson's going to be the guy that's going to fill in for him. In week eight, a lot of people have started Johnson. They streamed him because his versus the skins, and Athian was going to be out of that game. And they were very disappointed. He had a quiet game. Two catches, 27 yards. Uh, they were let down, obviously, by those numbers he put up. But a lot of it was gameful. I was actually at the game there. Uh, the Vikings never were really in trouble. They ran the ball really well in the skins. Case Keenum missed the second half there. Of course, uh, uh, the rookie quarterback comes in half skins. And so... If you watch the game, they just didn't need to do that much, the Vikings. They didn't need to throw the ball quite a bit there. Um, this rookie out of Colorado State has actually looked good this year. Um, they like him. He's been getting some targets. He's been efficient. He's played really well. And I think that uh, Anthony is going to miss at least one game there once getting re-aggravated in that thing. Uh, he, he had the bye week. He skipped the Skins game, still came back and re-aggravated. So now you're starting to think this thing could linger for a couple more weeks there. And Johnson, the guy's going to have the value. Someone say, what about Treadwell? Um, Former first round pick is disappointed. He did have a good day today, uh, but he's disappointed throughout his career. And, he, and for me right now, he's going to be the number three guy. Number two guy will be Johnson with dealing out. Number one guy, of course, is Stefan Diggs. You know what I'd actually like to do before we move on? Um, BC Johnson. Every single week we get comments about the way we pronounce things. Yeah. And no matter how we pronounce it, someone complains or tells yeah. us we're pronouncing it wrong. Now, we don't care, so I'd like to have some fun with it. Uh, leave a comment down below. What is the worst way you could pronounce his name? Because I don't know how to say it. i really just admitting that I have never heard that name before. I believe he's like from Kenya or some other country, and that explains why his name is uh, so different. But that's – I don't know. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just at the point where I don't even it's care to pronounce video. things right anymore. So about Alex Erickson, 94% available, and Odd Tate, 78% available. They play the Ravens next week, and 11 the most points uh, to wide receivers there next time they face them. Um, so Tate and Erickson, uh, they've had some fine games this year in terms of fantasy football, but it's been mostly volume. And the reason why they've had bottom, they've been playing from behind, they've had to throw a lot to play catch up there. So what's their value? Well, question to answer that is, what's their value? That depends on A.J. Green, um, if he's going to come back. And it sounds like he's going to be back this week. And so what that means is Erickson and Tate really fall number three, number four, because you got Tyler Boyd there. Yeah. And so number three, number four on a, a blow average offense with a new quarterback now because they're making a switch there. They're benching Dalton. It sounds like Ryan Finley is going to be the one getting the start there. Um, I wouldn't trust either one of those guys. The only way I'd consider either one of those would be if Green misses one more week or some more weeks there. Um, and if that happens, then you could reassess the situation. But I would stay away from them at this point. And, you know, the other thing to consider, if that team gets at all better, I think a big key to them improving is actually going to be you 
is actually going to be more usage for Joe Mixon. Mm -hmm. And that's a, honestly a guy who I think has been underused. I think that he could see more and more and actually take away from those guys. But that's, I guess, a very detail-oriented breakdown, probably more information than you need. My final guy I'm talking about is Mike Gusecki, 96% available. If you're looking at a tight end, uh, one, I think he's a guy you need to keep an eye on. I'm not sure if I'd grab him right now. Yeah, second round pick was highly touted when he came out of the NFL. When he was drafted, he had a great combine. People talk about his skills, said what an athletic freak that he was. And he was seen as a good weapon, not just your kind of typical uh, tight end that just blocks and catches a few balls occasionally. Uh, this guy was looked at as he could be a legitimate weapon in that offense. Now, his bag was hurt last year, one, because he's a rookie. We've done a lot of breakdowns, but there's a sharp learning curve for rookie tight ends. They typically don't produce good fantasy numbers. And then the other one that hurts development was just bad quarterback play. But today he goes, all right, six catches, 95 yards. And this is really what the Dolphins envisioned for him when they drafted him. Um, but right now it's really only one big game, and I think you need more before you trust this guy. But keep an eye on him. If you're really desperate, you can stash him on your bench and see what he does for the next week or two.